So good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I think we should get started, seeing as it's nine o'clock. I congratulate you all for getting here at this early time um, after last night's uh, fun evening. So we've got a very uh, interesting uh, session here. This is session 11C on clouds and virtualization. These are two very important topics that I know many of the uh, Terrena community members are thinking about and asking themselves their question, question, you know, what should we do on this? So hopefully you'll find some interesting input from these uh, three speakers as they tell us about their, uh, um, their experiences and what they have to offer in this area. So the first speaker is uh, Charles Loomis. Um, he is the project uh, leader of the Stratus Lab project, and he's going to tell us all about that project. So, Cal, over to you. Okay. And there we go. Okay, so uh, as Dave said, I'm going to talk about the Stratus Lab, uh, Stratus Lab project. It's uh, an EU-funded project. It's for two years. We're basically one year into the project now, and we're uh, moving on to uh, the second year. So this will tell you basically where we are and what we're doing. The Stratosab project itself, uh, just to give what the goals are, it's very simple. We essentially want to create a comprehensive open source infrastructure as a service uh, cloud distribution so that anyone can take the code, deploy it on their site, and, and have an infrastructure as a service cloud running within their site. Um, we actually focus on deploying grid services on top of uh, that cloud uh, for two reasons. One, we want to actually uh, uh, be a service to the uh, existing uh, European grid infrastructure and make sure that uh, those people can take advantage of uh, virtualization and cloud technologies. The second reason is uh, grid services are extremely complex, very touchy, and uh, basically if virtualization and cloud stuff can work with those types of services, they can basically work with anything. So for us, it's a very good proof of principle that the grid services can work on top of uh, an open source cloud distribution. As I said, it's a two-year project. We're one year into it. We'll end May 2012. It's a small project, only six partners from five countries. The, the six partners are there listed on the right-hand side. And fairly small budget for a European project of about 3 million euros. Uh, the contacts for the site are at the bottom there if you want to uh, find out more about Stratoslab after, uh, after the presentation. I'm not going to go a lot into what cloud is and all of that, just to say where we sit in, in the overall schema of things. We really do focus on infrastructure as a service, and it's really to make uh, essentially resources, remote resources, appear as if they're uh, in quote, physical machines. They're virtual machines, but uh, the, the abstraction level is really to provide uh, computing resources, storage resources, and networking resources that look like a physical machine. Um, there's several advantages to this. One, the most important for uh, scientific researchers, basically, uh, especially in the grid context, is being able to customize their environment. Uh, grid infrastructures right now have a problem in that the environment is more or less set by the system administrator at the site. It can vary between the sites. And so it puts an increased burden on the users to actually make their code more portable. And even though that's a good thing to do for the, for the people who develop the code, it's often very difficult, especially if all they have is the, uh, the binaries, which happens in some cases. Uh, so having a virtualized environment allows the users to actually have control over the entire stack. It means that they can really have confidence that their, that their uh, applications will run on the, uh, on the cloud. There are some disadvantages, although they're getting less and less as time goes on. One is that there's really no standard interfaces at the moment. There's a few defined, which are sort of in a prototype stage, but they aren't widely deployed. So hopefully at some point we'll get to standard interfaces between different clouds so that application users can really uh, uh, choose their provider rather than have to stick with a single provider. Um, the other thing which is still difficult is actually creating virtual machines from scratch. Um, it's difficult, not so much that it's difficult to do technically, you can do it uh, actually fairly rapidly, but getting something which is really secure, well, uh, well done, uh, doesn't have credentials embedded in it and things like that, is actually quite tricky. Um, so it's, it's actually a barrier to adoption of cloud technologies to uh, create these virtual machines. So what our vision is, is really we want to have the open source cloud distribution uh, with grid, uh, grid services as our uh, target, uh, target application group. Um, basically what happens now is uh, you have physical resources on the bottom. 
uh, grid services run on, directly on top of those physical resources and users come in and use the grid services. So they use the resources via the grid services at the moment. Um, what we want to do and what we've done actually, uh, which you'll see, is you can instead have a, having physical resources, you can turn that into a cloud. So you've virtualized your, uh, your network. We provide a cloud and uh, service manager API, which I'll describe in a minute. And you can run those grid services on top of, uh, on top of that uh, cloud distribution. For the users at the moment, if they just use grid services, nothing changes. It's easier for the site manager to manage the resources because it's all virtualized. They can move things around much more easily. But for the users who use only grid services, they see no changes at all, which is a good thing for, for the end user. But we also provide a cloud API. So the same physical resources that a site is, is allowing users to uh, have access to can actually be uh, accessed via the grid services, but also directly via the cloud API. So it means that applications where the grid is not a particularly good uh, model for their computations can actually come in, use the cloud API, and have direct access to a, uh, a set of virtual machines typically customized for their, for their own applications. So it makes sharing of the same physical resources with two different types of uh, application access uh, very easy. In the second year of the project, what we'll be doing is actually looking at uh, what's called hybrid clouds or cloud bursting, is actually allowing site managers to say, uh, my site is overloaded, and I now want to take advantage of resources which are sitting elsewhere. So whether that's an Amazon or another commercial provider, or whether that's another sor uh, site which is running Stratus Lab, it allows uh, site administrators to judge when they want to actually take advantage of outside, uh, outside resources. So that's uh, the plan for the second year of the project, to see how we can actually do that and make that actually function well. I'm not going to go in detail through the architecture of Stratus Lab uh, 1.0, which will come out probably the middle of next month. Um, so there's lots of details here, but the, the important thing is, uh, is the grouping of them. So for infrastructure as a service, uh, universally there's sort of three classes of, uh, of services that you have. There's the networking services, there's the physical computing resources, and there's the uh, storage resources. And then of course there's services on top of those to make them appear virtualized. And what you end up having then is a, a set of, of services, combined services, which uh, provide virtual machines to users. So just to, to say a few things here, um, on the storage side, this is, uh, we currently have a persistent disk service, uh, which allows people to come in, define a disk, uh, and actually have that disk stored. And they can attach that to machines, reuse that, and then uh, when the machine shuts down, you actually save the, uh, the disk itself. So it can be remounted uh, elsewhere. Um, at the moment, we only have disk-based abstraction to the storage. Um, at some point, we'll also have file-based abstractions to, to the storage as well. Uh, the reason we don't do the file-based uh, uh, abstractions at the moment is because our main users are grid users, and they already have a whole set of services which uh, deal with file-based access. Uh, in the middle part is the, oops, uh, wrong button. There we go. So in the middle part is the, the actual computing, uh, so the physical resources. You have some hypervisor which is running above things. In principle, we're fairly neutral which hypervisor is used, although we actually, within the project, use KVM. Uh, we use Open Nebula as a virtual machine manager at the moment, and we have an XML RPC interface sitting on top of that. We'll eventually migrate toward OCCI, which is one of these uh, standards for, uh, for cloud-based uh, APIs. On top of that, uh, we have a service manager, which I'll talk about in a second. Uh, for this conference, probably the most interesting is this bit here, is the uh, networking services, and that's actually the least, uh, least developed inside, of, inside the project, and I'll say uh, quite a bit more about that uh, a bit later. Um, but the, the important thing here is that all these networking services at the moment are, are um, used either via the, uh, the virtual machine manager or via the storage manager. So there's no actual direct access for, uh, for users to the networking services at the moment. So that's really a classic infrastructure as a service cloud. The thing we have in addition to that, which sort of blurs the line between an infrastructure as a service and a platform as a service, is called the service manager. And what that allows you to do is define, instead of single machines, you can actually define ensembles of machines. So for instance, you can define a complete batch system. And you can deploy that uh, batch system as a, as a unit and actually control that as a unit rather than having to deal with the individual machines. 
The other thing on top of that, which is interesting, is it allows you to create a set of business rules or a set of, a set of uh, conditions under which you'll actually automatically expand or contract the size of, for instance, the batch system. So it allows you to have a dynamic scaling of the, of the system without having to intervene manually every time. So that really sort of blurs the line between infrastructure as a service and platform as a service, but it'll actually be very useful for, for applications to deploy entire systems rather than having to deal with individual machines all the time. The other thing which is a bit unique for the project, um, and one of the reasons why we deal with the grid community, is uh, to some extent cloud technology is a very selfish technology in the fact that it's usually about getting my resources, using my machines, using my data. Um, the grid, on the other hand, is very much about federation of things and allowing people to share, uh, share resources. And we actually want to take that uh, federation idea into the, into, the grid tech, into the cloud technology to make sure we, in the scientific community, we can still support sharing and collaborative science, uh, even though we're using uh, cloud technologies. And one way to do that uh, at the very basic level is to allow people to share virtual machine images. So it allows people to uh, create their own virtual machine image, publish uh, the existence of that and allow other people to download it and use those, uh, use those machine images. And what that's uh, essentially what we have is a, what we're calling Stratus Hub Marketplace. It's a place where you can go, you can search for, uh, for virtual machines which exist already, find out information about them, decide whether you want to use them or not, and then just use the URL to the, uh, to the machine basically to download it automatically and to use it automatically. So it's a way of, of really facilitating both the sharing between different user groups and different uh, communities, but also a way of uh, also reducing this barrier of having to create your own virtual machines yourself. So that's the over, overview of what the, uh, what the architecture is. So just going, stepping through each one of them. So the, for the compute services, as I said, we use Open Nebula, which is at the core of uh, the virtual machine management. Um, it really provides all the core functionality, so starting, stopping, killing. Uh, we don't actually expose the suspend at the moment, but uh, we will very shortly. Um, it has a plug-in architecture, which allows you to use multiple virtual machines on the back, uh, hypervisors on the back end, uh, transparently to, uh, to the end users. Uh, we actually use KVM mostly in the project, as I said before. We have a bunch of enhancements that we've added to, uh, to the compute services and, and Open Nebula itself. One is that uh, we have uh, quarantined of stopped images. Uh, typically what happens is if you stop an image, it's usually just deleted immediately. We've actually put in a quarantine period where it will actually be saved for, by default, 48 hours. So if you have any problems with the image or you need to look at it afterwards to see what happened, you can actually uh, go back and see exactly what the image was that was being run and do any forensic analysis you want to do on that. This actually came up to, to be important. We had two attacks, uh, not really attacks. They were badly made virtual machine images. People came in, they had uh, standard passwords in them. They were pirated and basically used to, uh, to spam people. Um, uh, in the first one, we didn't have any of the quarantine in there. The second one, we actually did. And it turned out the forensic analysis was really easy because you just had the original image, you had the, the modified image, you could actually do a diff on both of them and see exactly all of the files which were changed. So it made the forensic analysis really, really easy afterwards. Um, not that it would have been better to avoid it to begin with, but uh, in any case, afterwards, it's also a bit easier to use as well. So we've improved the logging and, and uh, user resource information also to deal with security instances. There's ability to pass error messages back and forth to users. Uh, there's some improved fault tolerance and also uh, improved management of the network addresses. Uh, support for users, groups, and roles, which is extremely important in a grid context, will be coming probably just after the 1.0 release, which will be uh, mid next month. On the storage services, as I said before, we have uh, essentially uh, persistent disks. So the idea that a user can come in, say, I want a disk, says, I want a disk of 50 gigabytes, create that and actually treat that as, as a real disk. So you can mount that on a virtual machine, use it as a real disk, shut down the machine, the disk stays. So the storage is, is kept and the data is kept and can be remounted afterwards. Uh, that's extremely important for anyone who wants to save state of machines or things like that or have automatic failover between, uh, between virtual machines. So that that's, uh, exists in the 1.0 release and we think that's gonna be an important, uh, important service. In addition to that, we also have the idea of static disks so these are disks which are, are essentially read-only. 
And these are useful for various application communities that want to distribute uh, standard databases. So they have databases you can distribute, you can mount on the machine, you can't change them, but you know exactly where they are. The nice thing about that is you know exactly which database you're using, and because it's read-only, you can actually cache it uh, in the system and have uh, very fast access to, uh, to these various, uh, various disks. As I said before, the file-based storage will come probably in the second year of the project. Uh, we expect our grid users to keep using uh, the storage resource manager type things that are common in the grid world. Um, we will have uh, probably a CDMI interface for this, which is another standard which is coming in for on the storage side of things. The networking services, I'll spend a bit more time on this than, than the other things. Um, for the networking services, I said before, we have something which is uh, very, very basic, but responds more or less to the use cases that we have inside our user communities. So at the moment, what we do is we actually provide three different classes of IP addresses for the users. So when they deploy their virtual machine, they can ask either for a public, a local, or a private IP address for that uh, virtual machine. So the difference between them, a public IP address is really a public IP address. You can launch a virtual machine that does services, and it can be accessed from the outside, from the, from the internet, just like it would any other physical machine. So if you want to mount your own web server or your own uh, uh, grid service, you can actually do that with the public IP addresses. Um, the, next, the next class down is local IP addresses. And these are addresses that are visible inside the cloud instance itself, but are not visible directly from the outside. And any access from those addresses to the outside, those machines to the outside, is actually knotted through a, a box on the site so that they have access to the external uh, internet as well. The, the use case here is, uh, is basically parallel jobs. So if you have jobs or systems which actually run parallel computations and the things and the clients all have to talk between themselves, uh, you can actually use local IP addresses. You have direct access to the, the machines running within the computation. Um, and that's about all you need for, to do those types of things. The third one is actually called private IP addresses. And these are really uh, IP addresses which are only accessible from the physical machine. That doesn't actually sound so useful a priori, but in fact there's a very good use case for this. Many of the applications that we deal with uh, have master-slave master, master -slave type systems where uh, things like Boink, for instance, where you have some master sitting somewhere that has a database uh, of tasks to run, and then you have a bunch of clients which uh, are out there somewhere in the internet, and they just contact the server, download a particular task, run the task, and then send the, uh, send the result back. Actually, those workers don't need to have any access to the, uh, you don't need inbound access to those, machine, uh, to those uh, machines. So in fact, just having a NAT, uh, NATed connection to the exterior is enough for those types of computations. Uh, so, so that's actually a very useful thing. It's already used in the grid world for, for this type of stuff. The, the nice thing about classing these different, uh, different addresses is that uh, it conserves the number of public IP addresses. Uh, that's a rare resource, and you want to use those only when you really need to use those. So by offering the local and private ones, we encourage people to use those rather than always requesting a public IP address for all of their virtual machines. The other service we offer, which is mainly for the, the grid people, is that uh, we allow people to uh, deploy a machine and actually ask for a specific address. And the reason for this is most grid services are secured by a certificate, which is either tied to a DNS name or an IP address. And if you deploy it a second time, of course, you want to have the same IP address, because otherwise the certificate won't work. Um, so in fact, what we do is we allow people to specify a particular address. If you're the administrator of a site, you typically have the rights to do that. If you're some outside user, typically you don't. Uh, so uh, an outside user who does that will probably just get a random address rather than the one that requested. Um, so as I said, the, the networking services inside of uh, Stratislav at the moment are extremely simple, but uh, correspond to the use cases we have. But we need to do better, obviously, for, for the second year of the project, especially in the networking area. Um, and there's sort of two important questions which are here is what, what's the correct abstraction level for, for the network? What do we want to give users? Is it just IP addresses? Is it VLANs? Is it uh, control over bandwidth between things? It's, it's a question on, on what level of abstraction is useful for, for users. Um, the other thing is once, you, once we decide how you want to describe the network, um, how do you actually describe it in a way which is algorith algorithmic, that you have a complete description of it, you can deploy that, and someone on the site can actually take that and uh, configure the network in the right way. Um, 
So future services, which we will almost certainly have uh, probably in the short term, the first three, is IP, addre IP address reservation. This is something like the uh, Elastic IP service of, of Amazon, where you can actually say, I want an IP address. It gets assigned to you, and whether there's a machine running on that address or not, it's still reserved for you. So that allows you to do this, uh, this type of uh, service reservation, IP reservation, uh, without having to contact the system administrator in any way. Um, we treat that as a resource, so if you uh, allocate one, it's, you know, you're, you're accounted for having that, uh, that IP address for the amount of time that, uh, that you reserve it. The other thing we want to have is user-specified firewalls. So a lot of these services are actually public. So what we really want to do is allow the users to, to specify exactly what ports should be open to where uh, and do that all dynamically. Uh, and Amazon does this already. It's clearly possible to do this. Um, and we don't think it's difficult to actually to add, add that to the system. And it brings a real benefit in, in security for, for the individual uh, users who are using services, running services inside the cloud. A step beyond that is dynamic VLANs, so allowing uh, people to, do, to develop their own VLANs and have services, uh, machines running between them on a completely private virtual network. Um, that's something which we're also discussing with some other projects, Manticore in particular, about how we can, uh, how we can do that. And then the, the big question is uh, IPv6, both use and, and uh, validation of that. Um, and what that actually means. I mean, from the Commission, we have a very strong mandate that it must work with IPv6, um, and certainly we will make something which works with IPv6, but the question for us is more on the level of the users, so the people who are, who are deploying uh, virtual machines inside the cloud. Um, is that distinction between IPv4 or IPv6, is that important for them? Is that something we should expose, or is it something we should completely hide? They just ask for something, and we're sure that it's accessible, whether it's IPv4 or IPv6 running behind the scenes. So it's an important question for us on whether that distinction is something we want to expose to the users or not. And that's an open question. I think we need to uh, discuss it both with the users and with uh, the people here who are more expert at networking than I am. So the last bit uh, of, the, of the architecture which I'll describe is the marketplace. So this is, as I said before, a database of machine images and disk images which exist. Um, as I said before, the, the machine image creation is really a barrier to, to adoption. It's still difficult to do this for, for many reasons, mainly on make, trying to make them actually secure. Uh, so sharing these things actually will help lower the barrier and hopefully uh, bring more people into using the European grid infrastructure, e-infrastructures, and the cloud, uh, cloud technologies. Um, it really facilitates the sharing of the images. It's really just a registry. So what we've done is we've actually split the storage of the image itself, which we hope will take place in cloud storage, uh, from the metadata associated with it. So the marketplace contains the metadata. These are short entries about information about the individual machine or disk images. You can search that fairly rapidly. But the actual uh, image, the machine or disk image, sits somewhere either in cloud storage on a web server somewhere accessible via HTTP or HTTPS. Uh, the connection between the two is actually a set of checksums, so you can be sure that once you've downloaded something, you can, it really corresponds to the metadata that you used. And the reason for doing this is mainly to support the trust between the various, uh, between the various actors in the system. One is the creators of it, and we want to know who signed it. So, in fact, these are all signed metadata entries. The users want to be able to search it and figure out what, uh, what type of applications are embedded in, this, uh, on the, in these images. And the administrators want to know all that type of information to decide whether this is something they can trust to run on their site. Um, so either they trust the people who endorsed it, they trust the, um, the operating system which is underneath, a whole bunch of criteria that they can put in place to decide whether this should run on their site or not. So there's a bunch of benefits, both for the end users, creators, and cloud administrators. It's basically just a way to facilitate all of this sharing between, these, uh, between users and allowing the trust to be built up between all the actors to make sure that these things can be run. Some other services, as I said before, Claudia is there. Uh, I think it's going to be very useful in the longer term to be able to define complete services and actually deploy them and run them. Uh, the dynamic scaling and controlling is something which is going to be very, uh, very key for people who want to deploy batch systems or grid services to allow these things to actually scale to a reasonable level. Uh, authentication and authorization. Uh, we have something which uh, pulls out the authentication to make that as uh, generic as possible. It's a plug-in architecture there. We already support uh, username and password both with LDAP and with a standard uh, uh, username and password file. And we also uh, support grid uh, 
type authentication mechanisms, either a grid certificate or a VOMS proxy. So all of those things are supported already, and it's fairly, very easy to add, uh, add new things to that. We have a registration service. I uh, don't know if that's generally useful, but it allows people to register for the, for the cloud service. Their information gets put into an LDAP server so they can automatically uh, register for the cloud itself after, after their account has been eval uh, approved by a system administrator. And there's some accounting and monitoring which is there, which of course is very important if you want to understand who used what uh, later, in the, later after, they're, after they're done using things. Um, so this is a, uh, an advertisement for a test drive. So we have a reference infrastructure which uh, is run by GRNet. It's open to the public, uh, and it's basically there to provide feedback to the project, although it's uh, a useful infrastructure and fairly stable infrastructure. If you do want to use it, give it a test drive. Just send an email to uh, support at stratuslab.eu, and we'll set you up with an account. Um, you will need this to install the Stratuslab client. This is a set of Python scripts uh, which have uh, small dependence on uh, on Java if you if you deal with the metadata. Um, essentially, this is very easy to install. It, it's only dependencies on Python, a little bit on Java, and it basically runs anywhere. It works on Mac OS S, uh, OXX, uh, Windows, and Linux. We test those uh, fairly frequently, and we have users who use all of those at the moment. Uh, it's basically you download the tarball on on Tarot and uh, and and just run it. It's usually that simple. We also have a set of uh, provided appliances. Um, so base images, so TTY Linux, which is a test image, CentOS, uh, Ubuntu, probably will have OpenSUSE in a, in a, in a short, uh, short while. We have grid, uh, grid services as well, which are just images you can download and actually run grid services. And the bioinformatics community has started to define their own, uh, their own customized images. So conclusions about Stratuslab, uh, we're nearly complete. We have a, a nearly complete functional beta, beta available already. Uh, it's running on the uh, reference infrastructure. Uh, there's also a complete grid site running on top of the reference infrastructure. Uh, it has a proof of concept that this is actually possible to run grid services on top of, uh, on top of the cloud. Uh, we should have a complete beta uh, basically this week, uh, around 16th of May. Um, that probably won't actually be a public one, uh, although you can download it if you want to. The production release will be 1.0, and it should be out around 10th of June. So uh, mid-next month, uh, there will be a production 1.0 release of, of all the Stratosob stuff. Um, we're continuing to evolve this, and we certainly want uh, to collaborate with other people. We're looking at other projects, and particularly in this context, we, you know, people want to collaborate with us on the networking aspects, uh, both on how to define them, what, uh, what capabilities are there. We'd be very happy to uh, collaborate with anyone on those, uh, on those topics. Okay, so that's it uh, for the presentation, so I'm happy to take any questions. So we have time for one or two questions. People obviously very uh, <laughs> clearly presented, Cal. Uh, yeah. Okay, okay, if there's nothing, so thank you again. So now we have uh, um, a talk from one of the, uh, from the NREN, so um, Sobolch uh, Sekely is going to tell us about the, uh, the NIFI cloud, so that's NIF in Hungary. Okay, so over to you. Yeah, I think so. Um, hello everybody, um, good morning. Um, thanks for attending this session at this um, early hour. Um, my name is um, Sabolch, and I will uh, talk to you about um, a cloud project that we've done. Um, it's um, not that uh, big uh, as a Stratus Lab, uh, although Charles told you that it's a small project, so if that's a small project, I can call this a micro project. Um, so first, um, just a, a few thoughts that uh, we have about the uh, about why uh, an NRAN should provide cloud services to its users. We think that uh, our task is to provide useful IT services to academic institutions. Uh, services those are either not found on the market or not at a reasonable price. 
And if you think about it, uh, and then cloud is a thing like this. Um, and namely, cloud falls into the category that is not at a reasonable price on the market. Um, there are, uh, of course, uh, possibilities to, to buy uh, the virtual machines from the market, but if you, if you try to sum up the, um, the cost of this and you want to do this on a large scale, then it really uh, leads to a big amount of money that you have to pay. So um, commercial cloud providers are a way, but not optimal. Also, uh, if you take into account the, the, the services that are usually provided by NRANs, um, starting with uh, email, web hosting, uh, video conferencing, um, grid services, then I think that cloud is a clear successor of these services, or I wouldn't say successor, but um, uh, something that also fits into this category. So let me um, talk a bit about uh, the problems that we're trying to solve. Uh, and these mostly can come from, from the general uh, uh, benefits of virtualization. So we have an unconsolidated infrastructure, and these points that I've mentioned here are usually um, mostly uh, consequences of each other. So, um, because we have static hardware configurations, uh, we, we over-provision our hardware resources, which means that uh, we will have many fragmented free capacities uh, spread all around the, the uh, physical machines, uh, which actually leads to the waste of hardware resources, um, which is not green, for example, anyway, or not efficient in any way. Also, um, uh, with traditional infrastructures, uh, we have a dependency, a strong dependency on hardware, which means that if a hardware fails, then the service has failed. Of course, there are methods to, to overcome this, but, uh, but if you consider classical, highly available services, I mean, um, active passive clusters, for example, then it's also, uh, not efficient, it's, it's expensive, and there are quite there, uh, the services that we can provide this way are quite limited. And another way uh, to do this is to um, to, to pro provide services that uh, that don't have single point of failures, and this this is um, kind of immature, um, in my view. Just uh, think about when you, when you connect to a service, you connect to a single IP address, right? So uh, if that machine that has this IP address goes down, then your service has gone down. Um, and um, basically, these are the problems that lead us, uh, that, that gave us the, the idea of, um, of providing, um, of, um, I would say, um, providing cloud services to ourselves. So this was an, an inner need. And later we thought that if we do this, we would be able to, to expose it to member institutions so they could benefit uh, from the same achievements. Also, we did this uh, and we thought this because we found that um, the member institutions uh, don't usually have the, um, the possibilities and the know-how to provide service reliably and efficiently. So with a cloud infrastructure, we can, we can actually um, provide them uh, a basis for doing this without they knowing what we're actually doing, but we can provide reliability and efficiently uh, without um, without putting too much burden on them. So um, we're heading to the same direction as Stratus Lab, I think, but we're coming from the other end of things. 
So uh, we, we wanted to do an infrastructure as a service cloud, which is, uh, um, which can completely replace uh, the, uh, the physical infrastructures and it's as close as uh, real world as possible. So <clears throat> we were aiming for full virtualization of the infrastructure including virtual machines and virtual networks as well. Um, so we're dealing with these um, entities but I will give a, um, a more detailed summary of that later. What I would like to stress is that, and this is, um, this is um, a strange thing that I found when uh, attending um, cloud conferences like this, that if we're talking about infrastructure as a service, then uh, for many people the first thing that comes in the mind is that the infrastructure as a cloud, uh, uh, the infrastructure as a service is um, a service to run compute nodes. In a, in, in a grid. I think this is a special application. This, this is not the general case. Um, and I think that these two areas are quite different. It has really different needs, but I will show you that later. So we're definitely not aiming for uh, grid infrastructure as a service at the moment. Although when we designed the system, we also kept these um, uh, future plans in mind, and there are seeds of this inside. And what I would also like to stress is that we are providing a solution, and not the software. Although you can also you can download um, the software that we wrote, and you can deploy it on your own infrastructure, but we try not to um, put any requirement. Uh, on your infrastructure, or at least um, very um, light requirements. Um, one uh, special thing that we still have is um, some network-related things, but uh, but these can um, this can be solved um, easily, I think. So, if you want to deploy this software at your uh, NRAN or your organization. All you need is servers, storage, and network. And we provide everything else on top of these. Um, this is mostly because um, we have some integrated storage management. So, so all you need to provide uh, us is, uh, is some kind of storage space. And we will uh, put everything on top of it to expose it to the virtual machines. Um, so as I told you, this, uh, this project is, is kind of a micro project. Uh, the funding was already really a, a few tens of thousands of euros. Um, it started in, in February last year, and the first phase ended in um, December. Uh, there were f um, approximately five people working on it, and from January this year, um, we are doing some kind of uh, 1.5 phase. Um, and um, the output of the first phase was, uh, was a system that was usable, but it had many single point of failures. And what we're aiming for currently is robustness. So we had to put additional things in it after the first phase, and this is the process that is going on right now. And when I say robustness, um, I also refer to, to the difference between the, the cloud required for running compute nodes in a grid and the, the real uh, general infrastructure as a service cloud. Because I think that um, in, a, in, in a grid, in a, an infrastructure for running compute nodes, you don't need really um, flexibility. I mean, you don't need to reconfigure your virtual machines because you can just throw them out and create new ones which have more memory and more disk space and so on and so on. Also, um, I think but I might be wrong that in these infrastructures, um, robustness and reliability is not 
not a big case because you can always restart your jobs if something kicks in. Uh, but this is not the case with the with the general case of the the infrastructure as a cloud, uh, the infrastructure as a service cloud. So now we're um, putting features in like uh, multipathing for accessing uh, the disks from the virtual machines and we're looking for a kind of distributed file system um, uh, to, to store some auxiliary data like uh, CD-ROM images and, um, and, and some other uh, information that is uh, not critical for, the, um, for running virtual machines, but mostly for, for the management, I mean, creating new ones and, and restarting and destroying and things like this. All right. Um, the output of the first phase also lagged some um, um, essential features, like uh, it only had a, a, a common line interface uh, that you had to install on your machine. It was quite complicated to get it up and running. So um, we're working on a web-based um, uh, graphical user interface for it. And and one of the other problems of the first phase was that um, it uh, it lacked um, any kind of sophisticated access control, uh, which means that uh, the virtual machines and the virtual networks had one user who was the owner, and that user was allowed to do anything with them, while no nobody else was uh, was allowed to do anything. So. Uh, we want to 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 fine grain this a bit to be able to grant some um, uh, rights to to users who who are not the owners of the entities. Also, the other um, thing is we are focusing on deployment. So we have a, a beta test system running, which currently includes only one site um, and something like uh, ten physical machines, and um, we're in the process of uh, distributing uh, all this service to the whole uh, country, uh, creating multiple sites and installing more and more machines on, it, on them. So, um, what we have that I think um, are unique to this cloud So the first thing that I've hardly seen at any commercial cloud provider is that uh, the user is allowed to create um, virtual networks on his own. It's completely self-service. Um, also, uh, I haven't seen any other um, cloud provider who was able to, to, to freely migrate virtual machines between sites or even provide um, site level um, uh, redundancy. We also provide console access to virtual machines, so you can actually look at the, uh, the VGA output um, of your virtual machine. This is accessible from a browser um, in a Java applet, uh, and um, it's, uh, it's working via VNC. <laughs> What we don't have yet, and what I think we should do is, um, and I already mentioned this, is the, the ability to modify the uh, configuration of the virtual machines. Um, and uh, we also, we need some sophisticated um, uh, management of virtual disks and uh, virtual disk images. Um, which is um, kind of nicely done in Stratus Lab already, as I uh, think so. I'm looking for, forward to some collaborations. Um, uh, what we have now is we have a, a directory full of files, and they, the user can refer to these files in the virtual machine description. Um, so, um, so the uh, 
the, the, the disk of the virtual machine is initialized from one of these files. So this also um, currently lacks any access control system and the user is currently unable to list, uh, for example, the, the images. Uh, we have to tell them the name of the image for him to be able to use it. So what, what, we, what we offer that, that makes it um, uh, usable for the NREN communities, and I'm uh, thinking now about um, using it for, for grid services. Um, although it's not developed yet, but it's, um, it's quite easy to, to, to scale um, uh, existing um, resources like a grid into the cloud dynamically. Uh, and most of this uh, is with the help of, of the virtual networks because virtual networks, as I said, are completely self-service. And, and an important thing is that they're virtually layer two connected. So this allows um, people to use uh, protocols like DHCP, which is quite essential uh, for, for grid um, middlewares like, um, or grid uh, solutions like ROX Linux, as I know. Um, also, um, and what allows uh, the dynamic scaling of existing resources into the cloud is that these virtual networks are extensible beyond the cloud and still stay layer two connected. So if you have physical machines that run, that run uh, as a grid, then you can, um, you can extend uh, the, the network that uh, provides connectivity to the compute nodes into the cloud be layer two connected so you can easily uh, create uh, more compute nodes inside the cloud. And another feature um, that we have, um, although it's on still, still only a seed um, of, um, of real possibilities, is that virtual machine systems is kind of similar uh, than what, what they have at uh, Stratus Lab. Uh, we define this as virtual networks and arrays of virtual machines. So, so this can be um, 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 basically, this is not usual, it's not useful only for describing grids, but, but it can be used to describe anything that can be viewed as a set of virtual networks and um, virtual um, machines like a um, web cluster or um, or anything else that can be described this way. Um, why we need this is that um, one of the problems that we faced uh, and one of the problems that our users mentioned to us is that um, they, the problem with the, with the grid in the cloud is that um, if you submit um, a virtual machine system uh, a grid to do some computation for you, you can never know when the cloud will have enough resources to deploy that uh, virtual machine system. So, um, so the policy on these virtual machine systems is deploy now or never. So um, you get a deterministic worst case job execution time. So what we have in this cloud, um, what entities do we uh, deal with? First, we have the virtual machine, which is, um, you'll know very well, it's, um, it's as a name, some uh, dedicated CPU resources, um, memory, disks, um, uh, boot order, and network infrastructures. Uh, we have the virtual network, uh, I've already uh, told you about this. Um, the disk images we call golden images, uh, which are always cloned to the virtual disks uh, on virtual machine creation, uh, which are uh, also read-write. And we have CD images, which are uh, shared among all virtual machines, and uh, they are read-only, and we never clone. We have one single copy of it. And we have virtual machine systems, as I already mentioned.
So, um, going into the technical details, uh, a fundamental assumption that we have, that we uh, try to uh, keep in mind is that uh, one virtual disk should be one iSCSI target, um, which, uh, which gives us some, some, which makes some things easier and some things harder, but uh, um, we we thought about trying this approach and see what comes out of it. And this far, our um, uh, our um, experiences are quite um, positive. So um, this is how it looks like from the inside. Uh, on this uh, figure, you can see. Um, uh, components that were developed by us with this um, brownish yellow color and the light blue is the, the components that we took um, ready-made or modified minimally, minimally. So we have um, a machine called the cloud controller here uh, which is responsible for, for the orchestration uh, of the cloud. In this, um, uh, in this machine, uh, we are running Open Nebula, um, the core uh, of, of, of the system. And um, basically, um, we want to, to replace Open Nebula with something else, uh, preferably our own implementation. And this was the reason why we tried to hide this completely from the user. So we surrounded it with, uh, with our own um, uh, service layer, which is the um, NIFI cloud here. Um, and uh, we wrote some extensions to Open Nebula, which is the iSCSI driver and the virtual network hook, um, so that um, Mm, when um, a virtual machine is deployed, is um, the process that goes on is that uh, it pro the user provides a description in XML, uh, he throws it into the service layer, the service layer uh, performs um, authentication and authorization, and uh, forwards uh, the request to open Nebula, which calls the iSCSI driver, it clones the golden image uh, onto a newly created DICE target that is created dynamically. Um, and then the VNet uh, hook uh, sets up some um, um, registration um, uh, that will be read uh, on virtual machine deployment. Um, and then Open Nebula uh, deploys the virtual machine on the physical host where, uh, where the delivered hook logs into this newly created iSCSI target, the virtual network hook sets some, some uh, firewall rules that are required for the separation of virtual networks. Um, as you see, we are using KVM also um, as the hypervisor and libvirt on top of it. Um, just uh, to get, get, give you a taste of, um, of what, we're, what I'm thinking about when I say robustness is that um, we have um, two sites where the storage is installed, the storage that we're using. Uh, oops, sorry. Uh, one is the Novi Varos and the other is Chopron. And we plan to put um, two iSCSI gateways um, on these sites. Uh, they are running iSCSI on this side and also on this side. Uh, and the reason for this is that um, uh, the storage itself is not um, flexible enough. I mean, it can't be configured very dynamically. So, um, so we do some uh, logical volume management here and uh, expose uh, these storage areas to the uh, physical machines. And robustness comes in the picture uh, with, uh, with that we have two sites uh, with two uh, iSCSI front ends that use the, the same storage. And so that the, the virtual machine logs in 
via both of these uh, gateways to see the same um, uh, storage area so that, that if any of them goes down, um, the, the virtual machines that can still continue running. So this is how it looks like. I don't want to go into details because this is really technical. Um, so this is how a particular virtual machine can access um, the, the volume um, um, on via through a, a number of layers. Um, this is the, the physical machine that is running uh, the instance, and these two are the gateways. So what we have to do is to deploy the system. We need to do some performance tuning because it turns out that it turned out that uh, the um, performance of the storage is uh, quite low. We're doing some access control list. Um, we need to find some distributed storage solution for, for the tasks that I've already mentioned. Uh, the graphical user interface is already on the way. And uh, there are a number of other features that we want to add uh, after releasing the first version to the public. And most of these um, features require replacing Open Nebula with something else, I think. So if you, you got interested, you can um, join us in many ways. Um, for example, you can uh, try, uh, give a test drive of it. Um, I, but don't apply for an account yet. I need, still need to discuss this with the management of us. But you can definitely deploy this uh, uh, on your own infrastructure if you want. Uh, it's provided under a patch license. And remember, you just need server storage and network. And also, if you want to go further, you can, you can um, actually contribute code. And because we are uh, seriously lacking manpower to develop this system and looking for collaborations. So thank you very much. If you have questions, I'll be pleased to answer. Thank you very much, Sabolch. So, questions? Now everybody's woken up. This is <laughs> yes, there's one at the back here. Uh, very interesting. Uh, Ola Kitten from Unit. Uh, you said that uh, you were bound by a single IP address for uh, resilience, but uh, have you considered any cost? Oh, sorry, could you repeat? I couldn't hear correctly. Did you consider any cost for robustness or and uh, um, cost? Any cast? Any cast? Yeah. Um, no, no, we didn't look into that. But thanks for the hint. Any other questions? So, so maybe I could just ask one. You were talking about replacing Open Nebula. And I think you even said at one point about developing something yourself, but for a collaboration that's short of effort, that sounds, sounds like a lot of work. I mean, are you seriously thinking of developing something like Open Nebula yourselves? Yeah. Um, the thing is that um, when, I, when I sat down and started thinking about what Open Nebula provides us, I found that it's quite thin. It just um, it calls uh, libvirt comments. Um, it monitors the virtual machines and the physical machines, and that's all. Okay. We can do this on our own. This is not a big task. Maybe there are some opportunities between collaborating with Strasser's lab. Yeah? Okay, if there's nothing else, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you. <laughs> so then the final talk for this session is uh, looking at scaling up virtualization infrastructure. Um, Apollon uh, Economopoulos, it's, it's too difficult to say at this time of the morning, um, from GRNet is going to tell us about their experiences in that topic. So, good morning. Um, I guess my talk will be a bit uh, different from the two previous ones. 
Um, I won't be talking about the specific service we're providing to users. I will be talking about uh, how we deal with virtualization in our own operations context. I'm a member of um, GRNet's Network Operations Center, and uh, we are actually doing some heavy use of virtualization for our own services. So I'll start with a bit of um, our service history so that I can get you in context. Um, GRNet provides actually a variety of services towards our customers and end users, which um, include pretty much all uh, academic and research institutions in Greece as well as students. Uh, until 2009, we were offering the services through a virtual NOC model. That is, uh, the Network Operations Center was um, um, consisted of disjoint groups of people who were uh, partly responsible for uh, specific administrative domains in the context of the NOC. And uh, the services we, provi we were providing to our users were mostly network related. So it was purely network stuff, IPv4 and IPv6 connectivity, uh, QoS layer 2 VPNs and so on. And um, <clears throat> other services that acted as a support to the network like primary and secondary DNS, uh, backup MX, news servers, and so on. Uh, from 2009 and on, uh, there was a paradigm shift uh, towards a mix of more uh, network and end-user uh, services. So uh, this was combined with the development of an in-house network operations center, uh, which took over most of the operations of the NRN. Um, this change was uh, accompanied also by the introduction of new services, which were for the first time targeting end users, uh, like, for example, Pithos, which is our uh, cloud storage uh, service for end users. We are providing currently 50 gigabytes of uh, storage to every student in the country, uh, accessible either via HTTP or via um, WebDAV. And uh, Eudoxus, which is um, our newest and greatest service, it's actually a central textbook distribution registry. Uh, for those who are not familiar with um, the, the Greek way of, uh, of that, the univers that the universities operate anyway, um, most students are entitled to free textbooks for the courses. And uh, this is the service that actually allows students to um, register for which textbooks they want and cater for the centralized distribution of these textbooks. So it's, uh, it has a fairly big user base, and uh, it was a big step forward for us. So how is this all related to virtualization? Until 2009, there were some early attempts with um, virtualization, mostly using VMware GSX and Zen, uh, but with uh, certainly non-critical guests. So it was more of a um, toilet, say, or a proof of concept thing. Uh, since 2009, uh, with the um, uh, new network operation center came new hardware as well, uh, and the increased needs for new services. Um, <coughs> So we started gradually migrating everything from physical machines to Zen-based uh, VMs. And this happened for a number of reasons. Um, first of all, much of our older hardware was nearing its uh, end of life, so there was no support for it anymore, and it didn't make any sense to run production services on it. And um, there were also the new services which couldn't run on uh, isolated uh, hardware nodes. We, we didn't have enough hardware for that. So we started virtualizing things. Um, our first, our initial setup was uh, consisted of eight blade servers and the fiber channel connected the uh, Sun appliance. And uh, we used uh, one logical disk on the, on the SAN for um, each virtual machine disk. We didn't have any real cluster management, with, which meant we had eight individual virtualization servers, which uh, we were distributing by hand the virtual machines to. And um, by mid-2009, this uh, setup was actually hosting almost all of our core services, and uh, we had um, decommissioned most of the old hardware. So at that time, we had to ask ourselves some questions. We were not completely satisfied with that setup. Um, as um, 
a sysadmin team, we, for the first time, we had so many machines and so many operating system instances that we didn't have enough time uh, to properly maintain their operating systems, which was also part of a job description. So um, virtualization can be easily abused <laughs> when you have the ability to spawn, uh, to easily spawn new virtual machines. You uh, eventually end up using one or more virtual machine per application, or uh, it is an easy solution when you want to give computing resources to people who are on, under another administrative domain. And uh, so we ended up with an enormous number of uh, machines which we actually couldn't uh, easily maintain. All of these were also running on a variety of hardware which was um, imperfect, as most hardware goes. Uh, that means that, for example, if you had, a, in the past, your web server on a physical machine and that physical machine crashed, it was only your web server. Now, if you're running your web server and your mail server and your news server and another 20 virtual machines on one hardware node, if it crashes, then you're in bigger trouble. So what we wanted, actually, out of a virtualization setup was to maximize availability, uh, being able to monitor cent centrally for abnormalities and um, uh, act in a preventive way, in a proactive way, actually. Uh, that is, being able to move stuff from dying hardware before it actually dies. And uh, we also wanted to be able to enforce our global security policy, which means um, firewall rules, access control, logging and auditing, all in some way that could scale up to these numbers of virtual machines. So um, this talk is not about virtualization only. It's uh, also about how, you, how a sysadmin team, an operations team, can handle a big number of virtual machines in its infrastructure. So um, what we aimed at was actually automating most of the things. Uh, we sought automation solutions in two different levels. One was automated operating system management itself. So we wanted to use the operating system's uh, built-in mechanisms and not work our way around them. And uh, at the same time, we wanted to ensure some uniformity across all of our uh, infrastructure. We wanted our virtual machines running uh, the same way as our hardware nodes and the same way as the rest of our uh, services. And we wanted to be able to automate, let's say, 95% of our everyday needs and perform the rest manually. So the first, uh, let's say, measure we took was uh, automate operating system using uh, an automatic configuration management tool, in this case, Puppet. It took care of initial configuration of um, pretty much every machine based on classes. So we used different... Um, Puppet has this ability of uh, defining uh, classes which in turn define uh, resources that are available to each class. Resources include packages or may include files with specific contents or may include uh, SSH public keys. So um, we use these classes to be able to provision uh, different kinds of machines, including our virtual machines. Um, Puppet is able to automatically install packages using the operating system's package manager and also tune specific operating system parameters like uh, ETC hosts files and so on. And uh, it also has a powerful ability of modeling relations between hosts, which means that it can be used in scenario like uh, firewall rules, for example. You say uh, these five hardware nodes are part of the same virtualization cluster, and this automatically set up, sets up um, firewall rules that allow intercluster cluster SSH access for example. <clears throat> Apart from that, it also has a very powerful uh, data collection system, which is called the FACTS system, uh, which gathers information about uh, all hosts running uh, Puppet to a centralized location. And via a custom web interface we built, we made these available for a uh, query by the sysadmin team, so we can always get uh, up-to-date uh, hardware information like the serial numbers of the servers, or uh, security update status, which package needs update on which servers, or which, uh, which packages need update on this server. And um, this has really uh, sped, thi uh, sped things up a lot for us. And um, for the custom 
package deployment, we use a native distribution uh, repositories for Debian in this case. And um, this was the beginning of our automation uh, uh, story. The second thing we saw that automating, which is virtualization related, was the virtualization infrastructure itself. So uh, we wanted some real cluster management. We wanted to be able to manage the set of hardware nodes as a, as a single entity and not as 12 or 15 or 30 servers uh, standalone. And um, we specifically wanted to be able to automatically allocate virtual machines on uh, this pool of hardware resources and the ability to perform migrations and failovers and uh, so on in an automated way possible. And last, uh, the last thing we wanted was uh, being able to um, perform some health monitoring from a centralized location. Uh, for example, uh, being able to query the virtualization cluster for uh, instances that should be running and are not, or for instances that are in some kind of erratic state. Uh, until then, we actually had to do most of this by hand, so we uh, had to be sure that the virtual machine was not running elsewhere before we started it on, on a specific hardware node, and uh, we had to be very, very careful with migrations for the same reason. So we were seeking for some kind of um, uh, software that would uh, satisfy all these needs, because there was no uh, additional funding to do this. Uh, we had to restrict ourselves to the open source world, uh, which didn't leave us with many choices. So we chose um, a Google project, which is called Ganetti. And uh, what it does, it's actually, uh, it sets up a shared nothing cluster. Uh, what this means is essentially is that um, no node in the cluster, in the virtualization cluster, is that important that if it goes down, uh, the cluster will, will stop working. Uh, the worst thing that can happen is that if a node goes down, the virtual machines running on it go down with it as well. Um, this was very, very important for us as we didn't want to uh, have um, single points of failure in our infra infrastructure. Um, it also provided Zen and KVM support. At the time, we still hadn't decided with which one of the two solutions we would uh, go. Uh, it also supports a variety of storage backends. It supports provisioning LVM uh, logical volumes on Linux hosts or uh, using some file system like uh, one file per disk for uh, virtual machines. And the uh, most important feature for high availability is that it natively supports DRBD. Uh, DRBD starts for distributed replicated block device. It's actually a kind of RAID 1 over network. And uh, what it practically does is that it uh, mirrors in real time uh, the hard disk accesses, the hard disk write accesses from one host to another one. And uh, essentially, Gennady has the ability to have a um, virtual machine's disk available on two hosts at the same time and can migrate or fail over between those hosts at any time, essentially providing a very good uh, high availability solution. Uh, one, uh, one important feature was uh, the so-called operating system providers. Gannetti has the ability to um, call external scripts for um, the virtual machine's operating system provisioning. Um, so, for example, you can have an operating system provider that installs Windows or that installs Debian or what that pulls a custom uh, image from some HTTP location and provisions the uh, instance's disk with it. Uh, which is a um, great step forward towards automation. And, of course, it supports failover and migration, and it has an uh, HTTP REST API that can be used by external uh, applications to um, interact uh, with the system. Uh, this REST API is uh, actually read-write, which means that you can get information about the system, but you can also modify the state, create new virtual machines, or shut down, restart, or migrate. You can perform almost uh, every management function with uh, using the REST API. It also has a smart programmable instance allocation. Uh, it's actually, actually a pluggable module called during uh, uh, allocation time, so we can provide um, our own allocation routines that ensure things like um, if, I, if I provision two DNS servers, I don't want them to end up on the same node. 
because if I lose that node, I lose both DNS servers at the same time. So it supports things like um, exclusion tags. You tag an instance with a specific tag, and uh, it ensures that it won't end up on the same node with um, other instances bearing the same tag. And um, the most important feature of all, it has a very, very consistent CLI interface. Um, as a system administrators, we don't uh, really find web interfaces that effective when dealing with systems. And uh, CLI suite is very, very important. And it supports bridged and rooted um, guest NIC support, which means that we can provide layer two or layer three access to guests uh, in our network. And the most important, perhaps, is that it's free software under the GNU General Public License, so which meant that we could actually modify it to uh, suit our needs, and we could also contribute our changes upstream. So this is um, a really simple schematic of uh, the general architecture of Ganetti. What's, what's most important here is actually um, you can see the, the green hardware node. It has actually two host names. Uh, which means that it's currently the master node of the cluster. Uh, all interaction with the cluster is performed um, on the master node, which uh, means that any CLI command must be run on the master node, and all um, REST API uh, interaction is also performed with the master node. Uh, the master node has a, has a, there is a roaming IP address for this role, which is uh, taken over by whichever node happens to be the master node at a given time. So you just um, SSH the given host name, or you just connect your uh, REST API client to the given host name, and it's always the master node. Uh, there is a capability of moving the master node, the master role around by performing a master failover. So, for example, if we want to bring this specific node down, we can assign the master role to a different node that it will automatically acquire the address and host name of the master. And um, <clears throat> it also supports uh, using two different networks, two different uh, physical network interfaces, one for uh, data and one for storage traffic in case DRBD is used. That means that um, we can actually isolate the network, uh, the, the storage mirroring traffic from the actual data traffic of the virtual machines. And um, the whole uh, intercluster uh, RPC communication is performed using um, an SSL-secured uh, RPC protocol specific to Ganetti, and for uh, bulk tasks, it also uses intercluster SSH. So um, it's pretty secure from uh, that point of view. Uh, it doesn't need to be on a very, very isolated uh, network on its own. So the way we have deployed Ganetti right now is um, we use it with a shared storage uh, support on um, fiber channel loons or NFS shares. There was no support for shared storage initially, so it was something um, we had to develop in-house and which was eventually contributed upstream and included in the current release. And um, we finally settled uh, with KVM for running our um, uh, guests and are pretty much happy with it so far. The operating system we use um, is mostly Debian, so we um, effectively provision uh, every virtual machine using the bootstrap. Um, in that sense, we install a, automatically a new operating system for each virtual machine uh, in something like under two minutes. And um, we use a total of five different clusters currently on, um, in different data centers for different purposes. And uh, we are hosting approximately 300 virtual machines right now. Um, these three, out of these 300 virtual machines, uh, around half of our, um, our own services. And there is um, a lot of uh, virtual machines that, are, uh, that belong actually, that are administered by third party, uh, uh, like our customers. And we provide a virtual private server hosting service um, running on this infrastructure. Um, what I would like to note as a special use case is, um, if you recall from the second uh, slide, uh, this textbook, textbook registry uh, service that we have, uh, it's actually running on top of uh, 12 virtual machines, 
And uh, because it's federated using um, GRNet's uh, AAI federation, uh, we are also hosting um, identity providers and virtual directories for roughly 35 uh, educational institutions currently on our virtualization infrastructure. So far we haven't had any significant problems and the uptime record is um, really good. And being able to migrate things around has uh, given us the ability to upgrade the underlying hardware, both the hardware nodes and the storage, uh, at least twice without any downtime. So this is very, very important for us from an operations point of view. So um, after we had solved all these um, problems, scalability issues with our infrastructure, um, I just um, have to tell you that it's only four system administrators running a number of services, so it was really important for us to get to a point where we could uh, <laughs> actually focus on the services and not on the infrastructure itself. Um, we came up with a different set of bottlenecks, which is in a way uh, virtualization related. So uh, the number of third party VMs we were hosting initially was not that high. Uh, when we started, it was something like four or five. Uh, so the whole infrastructure was actually hosting uh, our own virtual machines, which meant that they were trusted and we could um, use uh, large flat subnets for us, and it made sense to allocate small subnets for every uh, third-party virtual machine because we didn't know what they were doing in there. So uh, the initial decision was uh, to allocate slash 30 IPv4 spaces and um, 802.1Q uh, VLANs per virtual machine. And for customers that for some reason had more than uh, a couple of machines, we would allocate up to slash, slash 27 subnets. So um, I know this, get, this is getting a bit technical probably, but uh, it illustrates some of the problems uh, caused by consolidating infrastructure in very, very few uh, servers. So um, the problem was that uh, network configuration eventually became our new bottleneck. Uh, slash 30 subnets were causing a serious uh, waste of um, IPs, which are currently be becoming a very scarce resource. And uh, we also had to interact with the network administrators to have uh, new VLANs provisions and terminated on the router and so on. So we needed a new model uh, for using our networks, uh, which would ideally include large IPv4 subnets for all hosted virtual machines, and, but at the same time provide layer two isolation of guests, which was very important as layer two is completely uh, untrusted in our uh, infrastructure. So uh, we also wanted uh, IP pool management and um, automatic network configuration using DHCP so that we could uh, automate as much of that as uh, possible. And uh, we also wanted the IPv6 stateless auto configuration in our infrastructure. So the, our goal was to provide layer three connectivity as always and make it impossible for our VMs to take uh, over another uh, VM's IP or uh, traffic. So at the same time, we wanted to maintain VM to VM visibility, so using private VLANs wouldn't really solve our problem that well. And uh, we had two solutions. One would be perform layer two filtering, which would involve filtering a number of protocols, and uh, the, the rule set that uh, would do this was not very straightforward. And the other one would be to perform some transparent routing on the hardware nodes. So we chose to uh, implement the second one. Uh, so there has, I have to tell you some things about the topology. The VMs are connected on the host using TAP interfaces. The TAP interface is um, the uh, equivalent of a cross wire. So um, the hardware node actually sees all VM traffic. And uh, the idea was to force the virtual machine to be routed rather than switched by the node, which was back then. So our requ uh, requirement was that the nodes should not run any dynamic routing protocol because our network administrators wouldn't be very happy with that. And um, the networking should work seamlessly across uh, live migrations. So the implementation for IPv4 was pretty straightforward. We could proxy ARP between the VM and the world and um, 
for Ethernet, on the Ethernet layer, we could just uh, set the host side of all TAP interfaces to use the same MAC address, so after migration, virtual machines wouldn't lose their gateway MAC address, which was already cached, probably. For IPv6, things are much harder. ARP has been replaced with a multicast ICMPv6 neighbor discovery, which is uh, really a pain, since uh, the kernel proxy NDP infrastructure, like Proxy NDP is the equivalent of Proxy ARP, can't proxy whole subnets. You can't say, I want to proxy the whole world for IPv6 on this interface. So our solution was to write some custom software which was performing um, NDP proxy in user space. And uh, we also used the same software to send uh, ICMPv6 router advertisements to the virtual machine, which caused it to automatically acquire IPv6 addresses and set up its own router. And using the same MAC address for the TAP interfaces um, ends um, up with the same link local address used for routing, which is preserved across migrations. So this is a setup that uh, pretty much solves uh, all of our problems, but it required some custom software to be written. So um, just to conclude, um, much of the knowledge gained from uh, our own experience with uh, virtualization in uh, operations was used um, as an input for our public cloud project, which is currently under development. Its code name is Okeanos, which means ocean. And the user interface is called Sinefo, which is a Greek word for cloud. And uh, we're currently uh, nearing a closed uh, alpha stage and the public beta for the service will be in the third quarter this year. The goal is to provide infrastructure as a service and um, virtu actually virtual machines for the whole Greek academic and research community from professors to students and from uh, laboratories to uh, network operation centers themselves of the, of the institutions. Uh, the technologies we chose to build around is Ganetti because we trust it and we have seen it and it covers most of our needs, but it um, uh, was lacking certain layers. Uh, one thing Ganetti doesn't currently do is that it's uh, user agnostic. There is no concept of a user, so there is no concept of the owner of a virtual machine. It's targeted towards the um, uh, system administrator. So uh, what's actually the core thing being developed is a whole user and accounting database that um, binds specific virtual machines to users and accounts for these resources. Uh, there will also be probably some credit system li limiting what people can do uh, in the terms of how many virtual machines they can um, have up and running. And um, we're also looking into uh, developing um, some private network infrastructure uh, by avoiding using physical VLANs. Uh, we have made some progress in that respect and will, it will be supported during the beta version. Um, another goal is full IPv6 support, both for the, virtual for the guest virtual machines as, uh, for the, as well as for the hardware nodes themselves. Um, if we scale up to a big number of hardware nodes, we don't want them occupying IPv4 space, if possible. And um, the final thing is um, we wanted to have a RESTful API so that people can write their own uh, tools around it. Currently, we have chosen the OpenStack API as it seems to be, um, let's say, a standard candidate right now. And uh, it will be integrated with our uh, AAI federation, which means that um, students can use their existing credentials and single sign-on facilities to um, get computing resources. And further down the roadmap, we have some um, integration with our own cl cloud, uh, sto cloud storage service. So um, we would like to be able to expose um, the files of, the peop of people from our Pithos service, which is a storage service, inside their virtual machines or have them attach their own um, space on the storage service as a disk inside the virtual machine and have uh, their files accessible via web and the integration with some distributed storage we're actually uh, currently investigating. All this will be available as uh, free software. Um, together with the, uh, re with the deployment of the service, we will release everything under a free software license uh, available at our um, code repository. So just to give you an idea, I don't know how, it's not, yeah, this is the last slide actually. So um, this is more or less, this is the whole um, Ganetti stack. Let's say it's the low level. 
um, virtualization infrastructure manager, and uh, we will be building on top of it um, an accounting and a billing database, and which will utilize a message bus to capture events from uh, the backend and um, expose everything via this uh, web interface. So um, this is pretty much what I have to say. Uh, if there are any questions. Thank you. So we have time perhaps for one quick question. Anybody has one? Yes. Let me wait for the microphone. Uh, what's your experience with the, the RDB? I feel it's uh, not too much performance good. So it uh, really depends on the, it depends on the application. Um, DRBD has um, three different modes of operation. So if something is really performance critical, you can um, probably get away with asynchronous replication, which means that you don't have guarantees that everything is committed on the other side, but it speeds things significantly. Um, our experience so far is that it's okay if you're not running something too demanding like a large-scale database on it. But for 95% of our uh, use cases, I think it's uh, perfectly fine. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, thank you. So before we bring the session to an end, I have three announcements to make. First of all, please do fill in the online feedback for this session. The program committee does value the feedback um, as help for planning uh, next year's event. So that, uh, do please do that. The other thing is that after the, ple the closing plenary session, um, after the coffee break, there is no general lunch today. Lunch is provided for those of you who have pre-registered for some of the events in the afternoon. But the general participants, I'm afraid you have to make your own arrangements uh, for lunch. And then the final one is that if anybody wants to print airline boarding passes, this is possible in the cyber cafe. There is a printer there where you can actually um, print your own passes, so I'm told. Okay, so let's thank all three speakers for a very interesting session. Thank you. Thank you.